Hello and welcome back to this random table where I fix stuff. Today on the BSS 250 channel we have this Dalton adding machine. Uh, this is from between uh, 1909 I think and 1913 or 1912. And the reason that I say that is because um, you can't really see the keyboard but I think in 1909, before 1909 the designating and the eliminating key I think were one key and after that there were two keys and we have the two key version and I'm not sure if you can read it or not but the latest patent on the patent plate is 1904 I think the next patent was 1911 or 1912 so that pretty much dates this machine to between 1909 to I think probably 1911 or 1912 so uh, I think the first thing that I'm going to do is get, take the covers off see what it looks like inside and then perhaps we can try it out I think there's just one screw here on the front, hopefully, this will come out. There we go. This is actually pretty heavy. I think it weighs like 50 pounds for this. It's not that big. Um, it does have the glass front panel you can see, and then it has a glass back and two glass panels on the side. Oops. So we'll just turn it around here see so the two panels here on the side and I'm not sure if this is supposed to be a handle or not but it works pretty well as one by the way the Dalton is the first machine to use the 10 key keyboard you might have noticed that it's a different keyboard than is common today so pretty stiff A little bit rusty. Hopefully the machine on the side is not rusty. You look at the glass, you don't really see any rust, so hopefully it will be okay. Uh, anyway, the Dalton was the first machine to use the the dual row 10 key keyboard, which then later evolved into the square 10 key keyboard that is popular on modern calculators. And the Sunstrand was the first one to modify the 10 key keyboard to the square format. So those are all out. Hopefully, this will just lift off now. Um, something seems to be stuck here. I'm not sure if these are. The, uh, and now we should hopefully come on. Something stuck on something. So I managed to get the um, case off. Uh, I think the uh, ribbon color changer unit. Um, you can see that the this is the ribbon holder, and this goes up and down. You can see rather stiffly to set the ribbon color, and it looks like that had a lever off the back of it that was stuck on whatever it rides on. Um, I'm guessing because that's so stiff, that's why it wasn't you know springing and coming off. So now that we got this open, it actually looks pretty empty inside. Let's pull the handle and just see what it does. Anything gets stuck. Well, you can see the handles are pretty stiff. These things are supposed to swing up and punch the punch the numbers forward, so those are pretty stiff. And yeah, it doesn't want to return. So something's probably not going up all the way. What could this be getting stuck on? So if you'll be able to see it when I pull the handle. So this thing right here, that right there is what was getting stuck. Um, you'll watch, see how there's a cutout right here in this piece? You know how there's um, 
Can we show him pointing out? Here's my pointer right there. See how it um, has a sharp edge here and then it cuts out? And I cut out. Yeah, you can really see the cutout now. See the, the edge of the cutout here? And now this thing has popped down into that cutout. Now as I release the handle, the cutout's gonna come back up and push that back up. That's what was stuck. That was not being able to be pushed back up. Um, that is the, it's related to the printers. Uh, I think that when it hits the cutout and that drops down, that's what fires the printers. I'm not sure if you'll be able to, uh, let me turn all the way. Um, the pegboard is a bit stuck, so it doesn't always go all the way home. So it's gonna hit the cutout right now. I'm not sure if you can see the printers at, or not. So, well, actually it didn't do anything because it didn't have anything entered. That would explain that. Um, but yeah, I think that's what triggers the printer. But because it didn't have any numbers entered, it didn't print anything. See if I enter a number, is what? So I go into a number. See if it'll fire the printers now. So just watch as that comes down. Yeah, I think that's what that does. Of course, the printers are a bit stiff yet. So you can see that one's slowly rising up there. And then when it comes back, it retracts those. So yeah, I think that's that's what that's for. Um, obviously, it's still a bit sticky. So I'm going to go through and try and lube and clean everything up. Um, doesn't seem too bad so far yet. There's a bit of rust down around the edges here, but doesn't seem that the mechanism is that rusty, hopefully. There's a little bit on the other side. You see, this thing here is pretty rusty, but this doesn't seem to ride on it, so I'm not, not quite sure what that's about. This is spring-loaded up, so it never actually rides on that. So, but anyway, I'm gonna do some cleaning up and see where we can go from there. So I'm working on this one, then got it, got it mostly loosened up. So I'm gonna show you uh, kind of what I did and how this machine basically works. So looking at the back here, and the window was kind of drowning this out. Let's see if I can turn this just a little bit. Now you can see it. So, this thing right here is the pegboard. If you watch as I push keys, it moves over for every key press. Now, um, down here on the bottom are the plungers that push the keys up, or that push the pins up, and the pins stick out the top here. So you should be able to see that if I push one, you can see the pin just pop up right in there, see there it pops up. And then down here behind this bar is a plunger that pops those pins up from the bottom. And um, basically how this works is these tabs on the back of here are gonna catch on those pins. So I'll put in one, two, three, and then so that'll be the backmost pin the second backmost pin and the third backmost pin in these three columns here. And as I drive the machine forward, you can see that uh, this level here, this level here swung forward and caught on the one pin. This one here swung forward and caught on the two pin. And this one here swung forward and caught on the three pin. So this one went one more position, this one went two more positions than this one. And what's going to happen is, up further up in the machine here is a set of gears, and as these move forward, they drive the gears, and that's that set of gears is the accumulator. So basically, this is just going to, and then when, when you come back, it clears out the pegboard so you can enter your next number. Let's turn this side here a little bit. So I'm not sure if you'll be able to see it or not. If I do it the other side. Yeah, it's so kind of hard to see. Let 
think you can see it now. Right in here. Oh, you can't really see it. Behind this thing, which I can't move. Um, behind this thing is a set of gears. You notice that there's teeth all on the bottom of these two. Those teeth are what drive the register gears forward. You can see them right here. So there's the register gears. You can see this little tab here. That is both the stop and the um, carry tab. So right now, this last position is in a zero position, so the stop is right at its bumper there. Um, when this wheel rotates all the way around, this stop will come up on the other side of this bumper and it will lift it up, and that's what affects the carry. Um, and obviously this column is the last column, so there's nothing for it to carry to, but on the other columns that's how that works. Which I'm showing the right thing here. And then when you want to do a total, um, it um, leaves the register engaged and it rises these up, driving the register until it, the pin here hits on that stop and that means it's at zero. So basically it turns the register backwards all the way until zero and the number of places it, is, it turned backwards is indicated by how far up the riser rows because it's being driven off this register basically. Let's see if I can show you that. So if I put in, um, we'll just fill this up with all fives. Now watch, it should drop the register, disengage it, then rise up, then engage the register. See, it dropped the register so it's disengaged. Now all the rises are rising up until they're stopped by the pins. The hammer is fired. Now it's going to engage the register and drive it forward five positions. Now, if I do a, well, I'll do an empty crank first. I always have to do an empty crank before a total. Now if I do a total, watch, it'll leave the register engaged and it'll turn back until that stop hits there and then that stops it and these have raised up five positions. And that's basically how that works. Um, as far as the hammer engagement, because, let me just clear this out here real quick. be able to see everything. So holding down total is what clears it out. So um, these hammers here only engage as much as they need to, so you don't get leading to zero. So basically if I put one, only the first hammer engages. If I had put 21, the first two hammers would engage. Basically how that works. And what affects that is You can't really see that either, can you? Let me see it from this side. They're right in here. Oh, you can't see that at all. Um, now you can see them. These things right here. So these are the hammer locks. So when they're down, the hammers are unlocked. When they're up, the hammers are locked. So if I push this down and drive it, all the hammers will fire because basically um, this one unlocks the previous one, unlocks the previous one, and so far all the way across the machine. So basically if you've got a, a, like some number in the middle column and zeros and all the others, you still want that to be like, say you had 5,000 in the machine. You, you wouldn't want it to put just a five in the middle of the row. You'd want it to have five and then three zeros after it. So the five raising up has to unlock all the hammers to put the zeros behind it, but not the zeros in front of it. So if I push this down, it will unlock all the hammers behind it all the way across the machine. And these are unlocked by these little lamps here. So when these, uh, when these rockers swing up, it'll push these down and that will un and unlock the hammers. It's a pretty simple system, but... Um, I don't think there's a whole lot else as far as the engagement of the mechanism. Um, you know, theoretically I can go through all of like the, how the total engages the register and everything, but I don't think it's that important. Um, there is one more thing, the correction key. That is if um, you enter the wrong number and you want to clear it out without having to run the machine through a cycle, you hit the correction key. Basically all that does 
is drive the register right to its home position. So if you can see down here, when I push the correction key, you can see that that pushes that out. So if I enter a bunch of numbers, basically when I push the correction key, it's just going to push the pegboard back home. That's all that does. That's pretty simple. Um, the element and the designating key, which are on the front here, which you can't really see. So that is these two keys right here. Um, the designating, all that that does when you hold it down and drive the machine, is it prints a special character in the outermost column, just as a designator. And the eliminate, which is very confusingly um, marked, is basically a non-add key. So when you hold this down and drive the machine through a cycle, it'll print the number, but it won't add it into the total. And I mean that's about it as far as control of this machine. I marked the correction key, repeat key. Um, that just prevents it from clearing every time. On this machine, you have to hold it down. It doesn't latch down like on other machines. And then for the total, uh, if you push the total down once, well, that's good. So it does it an empty crank before the total. And the reason for that is because of the carries. Maybe I should talk about that a little bit more. But um, first, the total, if you hold it down, it latches, or if you put it down, it latches down. That's your subtotal. If you want a complete total to clear out the machine, you hold it down, and then it stays down, and then when you do it again, it just prints out a zero that you know that it's clear. So that's basically how the total works. Um, and the thing I didn't mention before was the carries, which I'll probably show you on the back here. So uh, what happens is when those levers are tripped by that extra tooth on the gear, they let these uh, sliders here, I should drop this down a little more. They let the, um, these rockers here, they let them fall back an extra position, which drives the wheel forward one more position. And then when you run the machine through that empty cycle, basically it just resets these. That's all that does. Um, so that when the tooth trips that extra lever there, basically all that it's doing is releasing these to, to fall back one position. So I think that now what I'm going to do, now that this seems to be pretty much cleaned up, um, the sticky parts were, I had to oil the, all the pegs in the peg wood, they were kind of sticky. I had to oil those, um, the hammer releases, those were kind of sticky. It didn't want to release the, the the outermost hammer, and then when I did get it to release, then it would not retract. So basically, it would always print out all the zeros. Um, so that was sticky. I lubricated that. Um, I also lubricated the keyboard, uh, the pegboard latching mechanism. So that's this down here, the ratchet thing. I'm not sure if you can see that or not. Right here. This is. Um, this is on a rotating shaft here, which also has a gear that drives the pegboard. So basically every time you push a key, this ratchet will pull this gear, this gear here, you can see down there, one tooth forward, which will rotate the shaft and pull the pegboard one position forward. So that was kind of sticky, I lubricated that. Um, other than that, I think that's about it. So there is one thing that is broken on this machine, which is down here on the bottom. So this piece here, you can see how this just free wheels. Pretty sure that's not supposed to happen. Though so now that I look at it, maybe it is. Because the other this side of the shaft is the same way. I'll have to take a closer look at that. But basically that is the um, ribbon drive. And for every cycle, this ratchet here grabs onto a gear there and whoops and rotates the shaft uh, to drive the ribbon but it didn't seem to be working when I looked at it and I had just seen this and assumed that a piece was missing from that 
But now that I look at it, that might not be the case. So I'll have to get a closer look at that, see if I can figure out how that's supposed to work. But this is supposed to be able to slide back and forth somehow to change your ribbon drive direction. You know, when it gets to one end of the ribbon, it switches its gears and drives the ribbon the other way so that it goes back and forth through the machine. Um, so I'll have to take a closer look at that and see how that's supposed to work. See if I can get that working. So figure out the problem with the um, ribbon drive. So this piece here is the ratchet that the machine drives that pulls that gear backwards for each rotation. And this piece here is a locking ratchet which had somehow gotten bent and was not um, ratcheting on the gear. So that's why it was just rotating back and forth. So I bent this back into place. And now, I'll pinch my finger. Now, if we come back here, And if you watch this right here, you can see that it rotates around for each cycle of the machine. So that's what's going to drive the ribbon. Um, I still have to figure out the reversing mechanism, but that seems to be working now. So that's good. The emergency mechanism wasn't too hard to figure out. Turns out you just lift this up and slide the shaft over and now you see it's engaged with this gear instead of that one. You just lift this up again, slide it back over, and now it's back the other way. So that's pretty simple. Um, I guess the only downside of that is that you have to lift the machine up to change your ribbon direction. Um, although I guess on the burrows you kind of had to take the cover off to change the ribbon direction. So anyway. I think that about sums it up for the mechanics of this machine. Um, just on to paint the keyboard now. You can see quite a bit of paint's missing and some rust is coming in. So I'm going to see if I can get all these keys off. Hopefully they'll all come off pretty easy. Some of these, sometimes these keys can be glued on on these old machines, but hopefully they'll come off pretty easy. And we'll get this painted. And I think that will be it. Um, I just have to pick out what ribbon color I want for this out of my bag of multicolored ribbons. So, yeah. So, the keyboard's apart. It was a lot more difficult to get out than I thought it would be. Um, first, the uh, total pins and the eliminate pins were pinned on, and there's really no way to tap the pins out, so those keys are kind of messed up now. See, the total's got a big crack right down the middle of it. Focus. And the eliminate key didn't fare too well either. Um, there's really no way to like, see there's just a little tiny hole on the side and they put a pin in there, but there's really no way to like tap it out. I mean, if you even try to hit on it, the key stem is so long, it just, you know, vibrates the key stem. There's really no way to get any force to tap on it. And even then, um, they were in there pretty tight. So, uh, basically my only choice was to either mess up the keys like this, or to just leave the um, key plate messed up. So I decided to re get the key plate off anyway, repaint it, and then maybe sometime in the future I'll replace those keys. But um, also the key plate, which I can't show you right now because the paint's drawing, um, has a rod attached to the back of it that activates this lever, which is the designating thing. So this goes in to cause that special designating symbol to be printed in the last column. Um, this end is attached to a little flapper that's attached to the rod on the back of the key plate, but that rod goes through this casting. So basically I had to take this off and like lay it on its side, and then um, I could get the key plate out. So it's kind of weird, I'm not sure why they put it together that way. I do like these castings though. You know, see it's got even little like little cast feet. All fancy, almost like a, a fancy podium base or something. Even though this part is completely invisible, even through the glass sides, um, this is all solid on the front and the sides here, so you can never see these parts, yet they made this fancy casting anyway. So that's kind of cool. Um, I almost forgot that we still have to clean up the, um, the patent roller thing yet. So this is the case, and we still have to clean this up, you can see it's pretty stiff. I'm not quite sure how it comes out. 
By the way, this case is very heavy. It's cast iron. You can see how thick it is, plus the weight of the glass. So, actually, I'm not sure how that comes out. So, there's four screws in the back, and then it just slides up. And here it is. Um, you can see it just has one wheel on the bottom, and as it rides against this rubber pattern here. So, I went through and put some oil on it. You can see it sounds a lot better. Um, on this side is the ratcheting or the drive, so this is going to go forward and pull it back. This thing goes forward, grabs a tooth, and then pulls it back, and that's how the machine is going to drive the pattern forward. Um, this is also pretty stiff. That's the ribbon color control. And I think that's what was preventing the case from coming off initially because this has a, a lever that goes back here that engages with the machine and I think that was stuck on whoever drives it. So they did over on its side and put a bunch of oil on here and that seemed to run down the... I think this is a small shaft that goes to the middle and then this middle piece is actually a larger outer shaft that that middle shaft goes through. So I turned it over on its side and dribbled some oil on there and let it soak down in. And now, it's nice and smooth. There's also some, um, I'm sure you can see them. It also rides in these things here. You can see the pin there rides in that. So, let's put the um, pattern back on and then load some paper in this and see how it feels. Through here. There we go. All right, so that should be good. Okay, so as you can see, I've got the uh, keyboard plate painted and put it back on. So that looks good, better. Um, so our two unfortunate keys there are not the best, but I think it'll be okay. Um, so I don't know why they made the machine this way, but to take the keyboard to off is kind of annoying. So. See if I can show you what I'm talking about here. So this piece right here, this is the end of a shaft that's attached to the bottom of this keyboard plate. Now you can take this screw out and slide this off but even if you do that, you still have to loosen the screws on this um, support here in order to have enough room to get the shaft through through the, this hole here, because see this is hollow in here, so um, and then there's a solid bar across the top. So basically this shaft protrudes through the hollowed out area of this support. And in order to get it back through to take it off, you have to take the screws out of the bottom of this and basically lay it over because um, you can't lift this up high enough to clear the key stems um, while it's trapped within this frame here. So that's kind of inconvenient. Not quite sure what the idea was there. Um, you also, I took these two screws out to take this support for the designating key off. And I also took one screw out of the bottom underneath the machine, out of the bottom of the eliminating key to take that key stem out. Just to make it easier to get out. Um, other than that, I think this is pretty much done mechanically. I think it's time to put the top back on and get a, a good ribbon and see how it prints. There's just one more thing. This little thing here is kind of like a, a stopper type thing. It's, I don't know what exactly it's made out of. It's almost like a hairy type of hard material. Um, I took it out to look at it because there was a big flat spot where this thing had been bumping against it for the past hundred years. So I took it out and rotated it a little bit and put it back in so that this has a, a fresh area to bump against. Um, but it's like, it's almost, like when you take it apart it almost looks like it's phenolic, like the sides of it are nice and smooth, but the outside of it's all fuzzy, so I'm not exactly sure what material that is. So as far as the ribbon goes, it's kind of like an interesting setup. Normally, the ribbon spools are the metal spool, and then they have a stake on the inside uh, post, I guess you'd call it. 
and then the ribbon just, you know, you poke that stake through the ribbon and that holds the ribbon on. These ones are different. These have a wooden center, and then there's this little metal thing in there. So you can see how it's kind of split there. You clamp that down on the ribbon and then stick it inside this uh, wooden thing. That's what holds the ribbon on, so that's kind of interesting. You can see I put a red ribbon in. Each of my machines has a different color. So let's put the caps back on these, and then we can do a demonstration, hopefully. Okay, so let's make sure that the machine is clear. We'll hold this total, and it points out a zero. You see that? Uh, not exactly. Um, okay, so you have to wait until the paper comes up. Here. Now you can see it. So let's try our favorite edition. Oh, one thing I didn't forget to mention. This one here, um, like the whole entire one just came off of this key in one piece. So I'll just glue it back on and hopefully it'll stay. Um, I thought these were painted, but it almost seems like a, some sort of inlay that, you know, got loose and came out. So that's kind of interesting. Anyway. Oops, paper didn't advance quite right that time. That time it did. We have to do an empty crank for your total, and then we should be able to hold down total. And there we go. So you can see our answer, 3330. That is correct. And then you pull the crank again to unlatch the total key, and it just puts out a zero to let you know that it's clear. Um, as per the instruction book, that is how this is supposed to work. So let's try just doing some it's interesting stuff. So let's enter a random number here. So now let's try doing um, designating. So we'll try, actually we'll do eliminate first. So we had 45, 769 entered, so we just put in something else. Hold down the eliminate key. For the, well, it didn't advance the paper quite right that time either. That's interesting. I wonder why it's doing that. Um, anyway, hold down the eliminate key, it should not add. So if we do a total now, Yeah, so it did not add the 347 into the 45769. So eliminate works. We can try designating. Oops. So it will still latch down. So let's try designating. Okay, so that makes some kind of symbol all the way on the left. Didn't print too clear though. So it might be supposed to be an E. So does that lift the ribbon up? No. I wonder why it's not printing too clear. You can see it kind of there. I don't know if it's supposed to be an E or what it's supposed to be. And you can see there. I'm, I'm not quite sure what it's supposed to be, but it is printing something, so. Uh, I guess that's good enough. Uh, we can try repeat, so let's clear this out. Oops. So we can do 625 times 625, so we'll do uh, 625. And now in this column, we want to enter it five times. So we'll do... So that's five. Now I'll shift the over one by entering a zero. I'm gonna do it two times. Now I'll shift over one again by entering a zero. And now we'll do it uh, six times. So that was five times, so I release the repeat key so it'll clear. That should be six times, so now we should get a total here. That is correct. 390625. That seems to be working. Uh, we can try subtraction. I think there is seven columns in this machine. So if we want to do, um, so we're going to do 25 minus 5. So we'll enter 25 and then subtract 5 
we have to use the two complements. So I think we should enter um, zero uh, six times, and then the small zero six times, and then the small four once. So let's try that. So now that should subtract five here. Let's see. And then, yep. So you can see Punto didn't quite advance. I wonder if that'll just loosen up over time. Um, but we had 25, and then we had 995, which is the small four, and that got us 20. So that seems to work. Um, which, if addition works, subtraction will also work, but it's a good test of the carries of the machine, I guess. Um, I guess that's about it. Uh, division on this machine would be rather complicated, not very pleasant to do. Uh, correction, so all that correction does is if I enter something that I didn't like, I push correction, and that manually pushes the pegboard all the way back to the um, the right side of the machine to clear it out. So this completely manual clearing, which is interesting. I don't think I've, no, no, that's not true. I have seen um, machines that had that before, like the Swift had it, but and this is the only one where you have to like jam a button down all the way to manually clear it. Um, I did clean the glass. You see, the, I'm not sure if you can see it or not, but the front glass here has a little bit of scratching on the inside. There's real faint like light marks. Um, I was real, try to be real careful cleaning around this logo. You can see some of the paint is, is missing from it. The back logo looks a lot better than the front logo. Um, I can show you that. This is the side. You can see those cleaned up pretty well. It's a nice clear glass there. If you want to try part of through here. You can see the back cleaned up pretty well too. So, actually you can look right through and see off the side. It's not a densely packed machine, but so I guess that's going to be about it for this video. I think this machine should be ready for its next 110 years. This machine is from 1909, or at least the years between 1909 and 1911. So it usually could be 1909. Um, I'm not sure when they switched from glass to solid size. But I think it was after 1911, and the reason I know it's before 1911 is because the patent plate down here doesn't have the 1911 patent on it. Um, oh, we didn't try non-print, which is this little guy here. So if we do, the machine should be clear, so if we do 1, 2, 3, and hold down non-print, it should add but not print. I'm not sure if that's supposed to spring back or not. And it did not print, so but it should have added. And it did. So, see that whole thing? No, you don't see the bottom of it. See, this is how the Dalton prints. It mostly prints okay. I'm not sure why sometimes the paper gets stuck, but hopefully. That will loosen up over time. Uh, this one here is from the Sun Strand, which I did a bit video on previously. This one is from the Lego Mosino Totalia. The paper on this one is wider. It's a larger capacity machine. And this one's from the uh, Burroughs Class 3, which actually still has the old ribbon in it that I, that I got with it. Um, I spread WD 40 on it when I got it just to rejuvenate it for testing. Um, but that was several months ago, and it's still printing, so I just left the ribbon in there. Um, I'm not sure if that's like the original ribbon for it, or what, but it seems like they definitely dumped a lot of ink onto that ribbon, as it's still printing just fine. Just for comparison, here's the Dalton, which is the first uh, 10 key machine, compared to the Lago Marcino Totalia, which is one of the later 10 key machines, and this one is electric and a fully automatic, four function automatic multiplication division. If you want to see this one in action, I did a video on it uh, previously on my channel. But you can see that you know the Dalton even looks a little bit bigger than the Lago Marcino, even though this one does quite a bit more than the Dalton does, so it's kind of interesting. Though I like that the Dalton has glass side. I always think that's cool. But I think that's going to be about it for this video.
you know, Dalton's back looking again. And we got the keyboard that we painted. Um, so that's okay. Maybe at some point I'll go back and touch up some of this paint here, but that's not a, not a big deal. Um, the reason why I usually do key plates like this if they need painting is because you have to tear the whole machine apart to get to it. Whereas something like this, you know, I can do that anytime. It's just right here on the surface. Um, and maybe we'll sometime we'll place these keys that got messed up. But hope you enjoyed this video, and thank you for watching.